Um, and then I'll share my screen. So let me let me do that. Uh, share screen. Browser. Okay. So sharing the screen. And um, um, I think to get us going, I will maybe cover some of the words that we've covered in the group chat. So is everybody here in the group chat? Alan's advanced English on the group chat. Is everybody part of that? On Hello yeah. Talk. Yes? Yes. Okay. Um, so I asked a couple of questions and people were diving in and answering. Um, so, but not, not everybody. So I'll, I'll maybe just go through some of these words that were there. Um, yeah, the first one I had was to couch an idea, right? So, so let me just um, define couch. So everybody knows this kind of couch here, right? What you sit on or lie on if you need 40, 40 winks. Does everybody know what 40 winks is? No. 40, win 40 winks, do you know what 40 winks is? No? I don't, no. Okay. No. I don't know. You, know. you know what a wink is, yeah? You know what a wink is. So if I was to oh, wink, yeah. I to close one eye, right? That's the, the wink. So that's what wink, wink is. 40 winks. Somebody want to say? It's a short sleep, especially during the day. I get two with 40 winks right now. Right, so I often feel this in the middle of the afternoon. If I've had lunch, and especially if I've been for a jog at lunchtime or in the morning, in the middle of the afternoon, I feel like I just want to have 40 winks. It's maybe an age thing. 40 winks. So 40 winks is... How we sleep, right? 40 winks. I, I just noticed the way I'm saying that, actually. I say 40, 40. We don't really emphasize the T there, 40, 40. Let's just say 40, 40. Sounds like a D rather than a T. That's just the way we say it. And so what I said there was, that's what a, that's what a couch is, sofa, right? It's what you, so you sit on. But, you can also use, and this is what I wanted to teach you, the word couch with, as a verb, express something in a language in a specific tile, right? The assurances were couched in general terms, right? So an, an example might be, I might couch an idea to my boss. So I couch an idea means I present an idea. You know, maybe in the business, we should go this direction or that direction. I'm couching it. It's like pitching it, suggesting it, I suppose, might be a better, more simplistic word. To couch an idea. Does that make sense? Everybody comfortable with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like, any questions, just speak up. Put your hand on the thing so I can see you. And if I'm speaking too fast for anybody, just slow me down. Just say, hey, teacher, can you go a bit slower? Is that a British expression only? What expression, Monica? To couch an idea. I don't know. Ah. <laughs> we certainly say it here. Um, what you mean is, would, would you say that in Americas? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, look, let's, let's, let's look it up in the Merriam-Webster, which is an American dictionary. To lay oneself down or sleep, to embroider, to place a hole ready for use. There you go. 
to phrase or express in a specified manner. So it is, it's used in America as well. Am I, uh, am I taking from your comment that you've not heard that before, Monica? No. Okay. No, I, no, no, I haven't. Well, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so many, many, of, many of the expressions you, you use, I, yeah. I've never heard before. <laughs> yeah. Well, I say to people, if you spend a, a year with Alan, you'll speak better than the natives. <laughs> yeah. So, right. So, couch an idea that it's it's a nice it's a nice language, you know, to be able to use vocabulary like that, you know, demonstrates real, you know, real richness. Um, and of course, the best way to increase your vocabulary is to read books, right? Whether they be English books or, yeah, you know, e even even like children's books. Um, Angelis, won't be able to attend the class. Okay, um, you know things like I think I mentioned before, like uh, Mark Twain. You know Tom Sawyer, um, Huckleberry Finn. These kind of books are American. Um, you know, fun books that most kind of children and teenagers would read. Uh, but they're they're fun even for an adult to read. And and on the British side, you know. Um, Charles Dickens, any, any of the Dickens books, you'll get a lot of English, you know, in terms of use to, and in classics like Emma. A Emma is a real a key one, I think. Okay, uh, so I was working through this word then. Um, then, <clears throat> then I I mentioned this little phrase, eager beaver. And uh, Raheli answered that one, eager beaver. Uh, I don't know if everybody read through the answers, but what she said about an eager beaver was correct. So an eager beaver is somebody who's just very keen. Yeah, very keen on something. The context can be anything really, right? Like, and I could use it with respect to this class. Some of you are eager beavers, right? You're very keen and you read all the stuff and you, you, you make suggestions and comments and stuff. So, so I would call somebody like that an eager beaver. An eager beaver, right? So that's just a metaphor because a beaver as an animal is always very busy. He's always chopping down trees and building dams and things, right? So to be described as an eager beaver, an eager beaver is equivalent to being keen, keen. And let me, let me write it up here. Eager beaver. A keen and enthusiastic person who works very hard. See that? So it's quite a compliment. If I said you're an eager beaver, I am. Um, that's, that's quite complimentary. Okay. Uh, you know, somebody asked, is eager beaver offensive? No, not at all. Um, yeah. So then, then I also use the word ask as a noun and not as a verb. And I wanted you all to understand that. So normally I might ask you all to do something, right? I want to ask you to do X for next week, right? Now that's using ask as a verb. And that's the normal way we would use the word ask. However, you can use the word ask as a noun. Okay. And you would couch it like this. Right? I'm using the word couch there. You, you would say, the ask, the ask, right? The ask for next week is, I want you to write five sentences authored by yourself. That is the ask. You see that? So I'm asking you to do something. I would like to ask you for whatever, but 
if I'm talking about the thing itself, if it's the circle, the thing that I'm asking, I can refer to that as the ask. Now, you use this in business a lot. Um, uh, so in a business context, you might, you might see the, the chief executive has come up with a new strategy for the organization. Or if you're in Zen education, you might say the new principal of the school has come up with a new approach. And, and that's being rolled out to, let's say, every teacher or in an organization would be to every manager. And the ask is blah, 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 something, right? The ask is, right? Um, so let me, give me, let, me, let me give a real example now. Um, let, let's use education since we've got at least one teacher on today. Um, the principal of the school wants to improve the academic results in the yearly examinations. He wants to, or she, he or she, wants to increase the position of the school in the, in the national league table. Now, in order to do that, every class needs to produce better results. And so the ask is, what can you do or we do collectively to make that happen? Uh, the principal would like suggestions by next, the end of next week. So to be clear, the ask is, the ask is for ideas and suggestions by the end of next week. Like so. What does my ask mean? So I could say, I could also say, instead of the ask, I could say my ask. So my ask, right? It's something you're asking for, typically a project that requires funding. The actual correct word is probably request, but again, you're asking for the thing, you're asking for it to be included in the budgeted funds. So, so, so to translate that and give an example of that is, um, my manager says to me, um, I'm, I'm requesting the funds for the department for next year. Um, and I could say, and have you got a note of my ask? I need 50K for project X. Have you got a note of my ask? Right, my ask. So it is the thing that I am asking for, my ask. Or the ask. Okay, enough on ask. If, if everyone is comfortable with that, is everybody comfortable with what I've been saying? The ask, or my ask, or your ask, using ask as a noun rather than a verb. Yes? Somebody yeah. needs to give me a thumbs up. Yeah, or, or say something. Yeah. Good. yeah, okay, good. Right, another thing that I threw in in the recent chat like this last week was the more the merrier. The, the more the merrier. What does that mean? What does the more the merrier mean? If you receive more, you, you, you feel happier. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's, it's like saying the more people, I'm having a party on Friday, who's coming? Everyone's welcome, the more the merrier, right? So the more people come to my party, the merrier, the happier we will all be. So I want you all to come to my party. That's, that's the way to use that expression, right? The more the merrier, the more the merrier. The more people or things that are, the better the situation will be. 
Yep. Okay, very common expression, super common. Right. Um, yeah, now somebody answered this. Um, bandwidth permitting. So I'm going to ask you to do something. Bandwidth permitting. Now, when I use the term bandwidth here, I'm not using it in the technical term to do with radio frequencies. Right? Does anybody want to volunteer what it means? Anyone? Bandwidth? I'll, I'll, I'll explain how, how I would use it. I'll give you an example first and then I'll explain it. So an example might be, I need you all to write me an essay for next week. Bandwidth permitting. I need you to write me an essay for next week. Bandwidth permitting. See that? It's like a frequency. Yes, technically, but what do I mean when I'm asking it there in that situation? If you get the right conditions. Yes, yes, it's, it's, it's basically how much free time have you got, is really what I'm asking. So if I'm saying to you, I need you to write an essay for next week, end of, right, period, that's it, I'm just asking that, then you, you need to write me the essay, right? So there's no latitude, right? I'm not giving you an option to say no. I need you to write me an essay. However, what I would be more likely to do to you guys, since this is just a free Alan's English Club, you know, it's you're not paying for a course, and you know, you know, there's no exams at the end of it. And we're we're all we're all, we've all got our own life to live, right? And our jobs and our families and our responsibilities, right? So and, and it, it varies, right? And I don't know how free people are. So what I am more likely to say is, I need you to write me an essay for next week, bandwidth permitting, meaning if you have the time, right? With all of the responsibilities, if you have the bandwidth, the personal bandwidth to be able to allocate, I don't know, half an hour a night for three nights or something to write an essay, craft your idea, get it written out, then check it over, check your grammar, check your spelling, it's work, right? The bandwidth permitting. And where, where, the, where, the, the, where it really comes from is to do with networks. And um, uh, Elham is an expert in networks. She used to be a network specialist. She could explain this. But, you know, you know people talk about um, how many megabytes per second you've got in your broadband, right? Oh, I've got good connection here. I'm at my mom and dad's house and they've got good broadband here. So I can use the internet kind of freely. But in the old days, I remember when we have, used to have to dial up and you used to have to dial with a thing called a modem and it squeaked and tipped and made strange noises and it was really, really, really slow. <laughs> and you couldn't use the phone at the same time if you were on the internet. But nowadays, you can still use the phone and use the internet at the same time. Bandwidth permitting, right. Is everybody comfortable with that? This is pretty common. Yeah, OK, thank you. Yeah, so then another one is chime in. So I'm having a conversation with Monica, and we're chatting away. And while we're chatting, let's say in a corridor of the school, um, Mona comes walking down. And I notice her, I catch her eye and I say, hi, hi, Mona. I might say, hey, Mona, we're just chatting about um, the syllabus for next week. Do you want to chime in? Do you want to chime in? And so to chime in is 
it's like an invitation to jump into a conversation that you've not been part of. Another scenario, Mona and Elham are having a chat. And I notice them and I walk over to them and I say, hey girls, what are you speaking about? And they say, oh, we're talking about whatever subject. Uh, and I might say, oh, I've been thinking about that. Do you mind if I chime in? See, do you, do you mind if I chime in? I've got an opinion, right? And I'd like to give you the benefit of my opinion, right? And where it is used most frequently is there's a group chat. And let's say you're all here and you're sitting around in all these seats and my mom and dad's conservatory, right? Lots of seats, but it's only me at the moment. And let's just imagine we're all physically here and we're all here and we're chatting away. We're chatting. And there's somebody sitting who's very quiet, right? Not said a word, Shoshani. Shoshani's sitting there. And so if I'm hosting the conversation, I might turn to Chishani and say, hey, Chishani, you haven't said anything. Do you want to chime in? See? So it's an invitation to jump in to the conversation. Please chime in. Chime in. Okay? No. I had yeah. completely misunderstood. I understood that uh, it, it meant uh, interrupting when somebody, someone or two persons are having a conversation. To chime in, I, I understood it meant to interrupt the conversation and give you're, your own opinion. You're not wrong, Monica. You're, you're not wrong. It does mean that. Right? So, um, it, yeah, it's, it's another called, meaning. It's a, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a nuance, right? It's a nuance. So if somebody, I'm chatting. Pardon, it's a what? A nuance. I've taught that one to the team in the past, right? A nuance. I'll do it in a minute, right? I'll go back over that again. It's a slight difference in meaning, but not a big ah, difference. Okay. Right? So I can, I can invite you to join in, to interrupt. Monica, please chime in here because you're a language teacher, you're an expert, right? You teach English, right? So please chime in to this discussion. Now I'm in asking you to interrupt, but the reverse is also true where you can of your own volition come and interrupt. So I'm talking now to Ingrid say about something and you overhear us and you say, hey, can I chime in? I'll, I've got some thoughts on that. So you're interrupting. So chime in is, you're right, 100% right. It is got to do with interruption, but it's usually, it's not an unwelcome interruption. It's well- yeah, I, I, I thought it was annoying. No, definitely ah, okay. not. Definitely, ah, okay. Definitely. You could use it that way. And the scenario was, oh, I, I'm having this private chat with Monica and George comes along and he chimes in with his opinion and I really didn't want him to. So I could use it negatively there, like that. But you would clarify that in the context. Yeah. Are you all clear on that? Yes, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Now, the word I used there you weren't sure of was nuance, right? Nuance. Now, who wants to explain what nuance means? Because there's there's people in this class who know what that word means. I've used it lots and lots. And if you don't volunteer, I'm going to pick you. <laughs> so somebody chime in. Elham, I knew you would. Okay, you or Mona would explain this. Explain to the class what nuance means. Yeah. Uh, nuance is um, a slight difference. Uh, uh, a very little tiny difference in uh, something that we are des describing. Correct. See this definition here? Yeah. A subtle difference in or shade of meaning, expression or sound. He was familiar with the nuances of the local dialect. Slight differences. So for example, Monica and Fabi both speak Espanol. 
but there will be nuances of difference because they live in two different parts of Latin America. So they both speak Espanol. However, there will be nuances of difference, both in pronunciation and in meaning, I would vouch. Does that make sense? Yes. Nu nu nuance. Let me, let, me, let me hear the web pronunciation. Nuance. Nuance. Hear that? Nuance. 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 Okay. So there you go. That was a wee bonus word for uh, Monica. Right. I also said this expression, which is a negative one, not to put to find a point on it. See that? What does that mean? Not to put too fine a point on it. Anyone? Okay. To speak bluntly. There you go. Dead simple. Not to put too fine a point on it. Okay. So if I am if I'm sketching. If I could sketch, if I had any, uh, uh, an artistic bone in my body, there's an expression, an artistic bone in my body, right? And I was sketching, I could sketch with a very fine point. See that? A fine point. Or I could, I could sketch with a broad brush, broad brush, fine point or broad brush? Now, you can see how that if I'm wanting to do something detailed, if I'm trying to draw an eye, I, I need a fine pencil. I need a fine point. Now, so we use that as a metaphor because we say we use it in the negative sense, always, usually all, nearly always, we say not to put too fine a point on it as a preface for what I'm about to say. What I'm saying is I'm signposting that I'm gonna say something quite blunt. To get straight to the point would be something similar. Exactly, Monica. Top class, top notch, yeah. I'm gonna get straight to the point. But straight to the point is a bit like, it's a wee bit different, there's a nuance of difference here. I'm using that word again, so you, you get to know that word, right? There's a nuance of difference here. To get straight to the point is the opposite of beating about the bush. Have you heard the expression beating about the bush? Yeah. Yeah, so beating about the bush is talking about everything except the thing we're meant to be talking about, right? So, um, John wanted to ask Janet out for a dance, right? <laughs> and he was shy and he was beating about the bush. He wouldn't get to the point. He didn't get straight to the point, right? That's what straight to the point means. To not put too fine a point on it is, is really used in a different context. So for example, if I was commenting on the situation in Ukraine, um, somebody might say, oh, it's, it's terrible, it's really, awful that situation on the ground there and I might say well not to put too fine a point on it it is all Putin's fault right I might say that and I would say that right I would say he's a madman right so not to put too fine a point I'm about I'm telling you I'm signposting before I say what I'm about to say I'm signposting that I'm going to tell you something quite blunt and because I'm going to speak very bluntly, I'm not going to just speak bluntly, although I could, and say he's a madman. I'm going to signpost, I'm going to speak bluntly. 
Now, not to put too fine a point on it, it's almost like I'm getting you ready because I'm about to say something quite direct. Now, does that all make sense? I, I, sorry, but I don't get what, what signpost uh, means. Okay. In this context. All right. All right. That's, that's good. That's a good chance. So, you know, you know, if a train, if a train is um, going down the tracks, every so often there are signs to the left of the, the railway that tell the driver about something that's coming up, right? He might, there might be a sign that says there's a bend coming. So he needs to slow the train down. And so in order to demonstrate that, there's a signpost. Or you might be driving down a highway in the car and there's a signpost that tells you there's a junction coming up in half a mile. So that's what, what a signpost is physically. Yes, it could be a speed limit or it could be, you know, we're on the, going to a dual carriageway. Anything on the roadside or on the railway side is a signpost. Right? So that's physically what it is. However, I am using that metaphorically to say, I am going to signpost to you, which means I'm telling you ahead of time something. I'll give you an example. Um, I am about to um, change jobs and leave my company, but I have not signposted to my boss that it's happening. So I've not, you see, I've not signposted that that's going to happen. I'll just tell him wh when I resign, which will be next week. <laughs> So I have not signposted to my boss. I, in other words, I haven't told him ahead of time. I'm just going to tell him at the time. So that's what signpost means. Are you comfortable with that, Monica? Yes, uh, I, I've uh, never heard the, the okay. use in this way. All right. Now, I'm very conscious that I am doing all the talking on this call, right? 99% of the call. And... That's helpful to you guys because you're getting to listen to a speaker. So that's good, right? But it's also important that you guys feel free to speak right? and interrupt me and practice your speech. Now, I can force you to do that because I could do a role play or something next. We might do that if you'd like to do that. You know, where you're like, I'm interviewing one of you for a job, say, that might be a good idea. Or something like that. But... I want you to feel free to speak. Now, I'm not going to force anybody to speak because some people mightn't be comfortable. But I want you to feel free to interrupt me, either just jumping in and saying something or putting your hand up. Elham, you've got your hand up, my dear, at the moment. Uh, and then I'll come to you. Yeah. Okay, so, so learning language is partly about listening, partly about understanding, and then it's also partly getting comfortable with speaking and articulating. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you'll be. Okay? I'll, I'll, so I'll just, I'll just throw that point in there, right? So, you know, feel free to interrupt me. Now, on the getting back to putting a fine point on things, yes, Mona. Uh, teacher, excuse me, I didn't understand exactly that. What's the meaning of this uh, expression? Um, it means um, saying frankly, saying something frankly. Yes, you got it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Now. I, just on the theme of using painting metaphors, Ingrid, do you have a question as well? Yes, teacher, sorry for inter interrupting you. <laughs> no problem. Uh, 
Um, I asked you about the dictionary. What is the best dictionary for translate? The word reference or Mary Webster? Because the phone is very bad and no. I, are you asking what's the best dictionary to use? Ingrid? Yes, yes, because I. I saw that you use Merit Webster, then I, I stay with the youth because I use word reference. Yeah. So, okay. So, um, are you looking for a physical book kind of uh, dictionary or are you looking for a web one on the computer? Uh, could be a computer. Yes. So, uh, okay. Well, I'll just tell oh, you what. About or what could be? Yeah. So I find, like, I've got a real dictionary upstairs, right? I've got a big English one and I've got a Spanish one as well, right? Mm -hmm. But I have to admit that I don't really use the, the big dictionaries anymore because it's so fast to look stuff up on your phone, right? It's just so fast. And, and Yes. Even, and, and also yeah. on the web here, like, you see, I'm just typing in words into Google here. And I'm getting, I'm getting the dictionaries popping up, you know. Uh, Google's one comes from Oxford Dictionaries, which is a very good starting point. Um, but sometimes there, there's the Cambridge Dictionary, say Dictionary Cambridge. So, so sometimes I'll look up the Oxford meaning, then I'll look up the Cambridge meaning, and then I'll look up Merriam-Webster. I'm getting three different perspectives on the word. Um. And often you really know what it means, but you're just wanting to understand the official wording on it, right? So I like, if, if you, somebody asks me what a word means, or I think of a word to tell you, I like to give you my definition first, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm therefore, I'm not tainted in some way, right? I just, I'm just telling you what everyday usage is. But then I'll go and say, well, okay, so what's the official definition now? And sometimes there's a nuance that I, that I, I, I missed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes, yes. and sometimes there's a definition there that I, I didn't know. I, I don't know. You know, it's every day, as we say, every day is a school day, right? We all learn all the time, even me. Even if I'm teaching you, I will still learn stuff about English I didn't know because it's such a, a big language. Mm -hmm. so 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 what i typically do is if i want to look up a word i will just type it right in here right so the one i'm going to teach you next is broad oh there so broad church is one i've done before but this time i'm going to do broad brush what does a broad brush mean and this is the opposite to a fine point right broad brush lacking detail and finesse mm -hmm. so if i if I want to paint the wall, as opposed to the painting, I need a broad brush, a brush the size of my hand, yeah? Mm -hmm. A broad brush. So, so, Alan, what are your plans for the summer? I could say, well, I'm not really sure. I could tell you in broad brush what I'd like to do. Mm -hmm. meaning I, I can't give you detail because I don't have the detail, but I, I would like to travel a bit. I'd like to travel to a Spanish-speaking country and practice some Espanol mm -hmm. and embarrass myself. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, so, teacher. Okay. So that's broad brush. So broad brush is the opposite to a fine point. Not to but, but for example, can you say if you if someone asks you how many students uh, have you got, you can say broad brush. I have I don't know seventy one students. Correct. That is. is that? Example. Okay. Exactly. Thanks. Exactly. Um, or I could have said approximately, or round about. We we use here a grosso modo. Is that, Spanish? Modo. <laughs> is that a Spanish word? Uh, I don't know, <laughs> but we use it. Okay. 
It's like more or less. More or less. Cool. We, we would say that as well, more or less. Okay. All right. Now, it's taken all that time to cover all the words that we discussed in the last week, few days. Amazing. Um, only one left out was the one that Mona asked, and I'll just do it here for completeness. She asked what stressed out of my box means. Does anybody remember what I said? I want to answer. Or Mona can say, what does it mean to be stressed out of my box? What does that mean? Okay, right. Let's go back to basics. What does stress mean? What is stress? Tension. Tension. Yes, Alan, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think I remember like uh, uh, I am under a pressure more than my uh, tolerance. Yes, that's a good way to define it. Yeah. So let's look at what the web says. Stress is our body's response to pressure. Many different situations or life events can cause stress. It is often triggered when we experience something new, unexpected, or what threatens our sense of self, or when we feel with little control over a situation. We all deal with stress differently. So you could say that almost everybody in Ukraine right now is stressed, right? Because there's been an invading army and there's bombs going off and there's sirens going off at night. And, you know, that's what stress is. Stress. Okay. So stress is more than just anxiety. Like what's anxiety? Anxiety is when we feel worried, tense, or afraid. Right? But stress is a bit more than that. Now, if I wanted to turn the volume up on stress, that's all I'm doing, I might say I'm stressed out. I'm stressed out, right? Well, it's obviously a song. Who cares about that? Definition. <laughs> <coughs> Definition of stressed out, suffering from high levels of physical or especially psychological stress. Stressed out. And then finally, stressed out of my box. Right? Means, I really can't get a, a good definition on the web for this. Stressed out of my box means I am so stressed out, I'm like almost panicking, right? I, I can't cope. I need to pop some pills. I need to go to the doctor. I need to get sign off from work. I need to not work for a month because I'm stressed out of my box. Stressed out of my box. Okay, I hope none of you are stressed out of your box. But you might say you're stressed out of your box if you're doing an exam tomorrow and you haven't fully prepared or you don't feel prepared, you might say, oh, Alan, I'm really stressed out of my box. Stressed out of my box. Okay, very common, very common in Britain. I don't know if they say it in America. Why bikes, teacher? What was that, Mona? Why bikes, teacher? Why box? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But that's what we say. Stress out of my box. Uh, I don't know. I don't know why we say that. I don't know. Okay. Sorry. Can't answer that one. Okay. Uh, right, let me go to my word list, and I've got some interesting words for you guys. Some lovely words. Yeah, All right, here, here's, a, here's a really good expression, which I'm guessing you won't know. Pushing the envelope. Anyone got a clue what that means? Pushing the envelope? 
about to bring some good news. <laughs> I don't know. I imagine the, the, the man from the post. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good guess, Monica. But that's not what it means. But that's a good guess. To push the envelope means to surpass normal limits or attempt something viewed as radical or risky. So you could say, for example, that Elon Musk is always pushing the envelope. He is always pushing the envelope because he's trying new stuff all the time and he's, it's radical. It comes from the aeronautical use of envelope referring to performance limits that cannot be exceeded safely. I didn't know that. The phrase was originally limited to space flight before spreading to other risky accomplishments and finally metaphorically to any boundary pushing activity such as art. The phrase push the envelope means to go beyond normal limits and to try out a new and different idea that is often viewed as radical or risky. Here's an example. Piccanini is the newest member of the Yonder Mountain String Bands that's been redefining bluegrass music by pushing the envelope into realms of rock and roll and improvisation. The noun envelope may be most commonly understood as an item of stationery in which other items can be enclosed as for mailing, that's what Monica was referring to. But there are a number of other senses of the word, many from science, that involve enclosure. These senses include the outer covering of an aerostat, the bag containing the gas in the balloon or airship, an enclosing membrane, a surface, a curve or surface tangent to each family of curves, blah, blah, blah. It's getting a bit technical now. Anyway, I think we're clear on what the meaning of pushing the envelope. So some of you will be of a certain character trait that you want to push the envelope. And some of you with your character traits will not feel comfortable doing that. No, 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 no. I wanna, I wanna keep inside my box. Yeah, we use this, we use inside and outside the box a lot, Mona. We say that a lot. Like you could put somebody down and say, get back in your box. Get back in your box mm. means you're, you're outside your box just now, right? Okay. Uh, okay. I also said something there interesting, I think. Character trait, do you know what a character trait is? I, I didn't get what, what the go back in your box means. All right, all right. No longer conspicuous or calling attention to yourself. Return to low profile and formal. If the boss reprimands him, he should put him back in his box, finally. So in other words, if you're outside your box, you have gone beyond the limits of what is expected of you. And so a great put down is get back in your box. <laughs> get back in your box, right? So in other words, somebody is saying something that is beyond their responsibility to say, right? Right? So if I, for example, spoke out at a business meeting, I currently work at a bank and I said, the bank shouldn't be doing this. It should be doing, shouldn't be doing X, it should be doing Y, right? And I said this at a very public meeting with very senior people there who could get embarrassed by what I'm saying. Somebody, say a middle manager, might stand up and say, Alan, can you get back in your box? Now that's, that's a very, very sharp put down, like get back in your box. You shouldn't even be saying what you're saying. Right? Um, after my boss reprimanded me, I just decided to get back in my box. I'm not going to give them the benefit of my opinion anymore. I'm upset. Back in one's box. 
Is there any other similar expression for this? Colloquial, right? Um, that's a good question. I can't think of one. Um, yeah, sorry. There will be there will be one. There will be some, but I don't know. Um, here, here, here is a. A very good example. In 2002, Sunday Herald, since the invasion of Kuwait, Saddam Hussein has been put back in his box and has hardly stirred against the West. So you see the meaning there was saying Saddam was stepping out beyond his region, you know, but after the invasion, you know, he got back in his box. So in other words, he just decided to shut up. He wasn't, he wasn't going to challenge the West anymore. Yeah. It's pretty common, it's very, it's widely used. So he was no longer pushing the envelope. Right? He was pushing the envelope before, but now since the invasion, he decided he wasn't pushing the envelope anymore and he was back in his box. Right, here's a good expression. Hell to pay. What does that mean? People would say, oops, I've lost, what did I do there? I don't know. There'll be hell to pay. What does that mean? Anyone? Uh, I don't know. I think that something is expensive. Not really, that's a good guess, but that's not what it means. When someone uh, must to pay something, obligatory? <laughs> no, it doesn't really mean, it's not um, got to do with making a payment, right? It's uh, hell to pay in the sense of there'll be um, a terrible, outcome from some situation right just just really really terrible result right so there'll be hell to pay so so in other words um like somebody might say uh, i need to do this by saturday or there'll be hell to pay right <laughs> or there'll be hell to pay right um and uh, so you're not being specific but you're just saying there'll be a great price to pay but it's not really monetary it's not to do with money's dollars and pounds and things like that there will be hell to pay serious trouble will occur as a result of the previously proposed action when i got it wrong there would be hell to pay right so it's a way of saying serious trouble sure. mm -hmm. If you say there'll be hell to pay, you're emphasizing there'll be serious trouble. Some, something you say, which means someone will be very angry if something happens. There'll be hell to pay if she doesn't get the money in time. Okay. This is, this is a very common parlance. Uh, Americans would use this as well as Brits. Hell to pay. Right, here's another good expression. Truth be told.
Now, this is, this is another one of those scenarios where it's used as a signpost. Earlier, I was saying, talking about signposting, not to put too fine a point on it. I said it was a kind of a signpost that is said before you say the thing you're going to say. Now, truth be told is like that. I can say truth be told and then make my statement. Alan, why do you run these English classes? Truth be told, I really enjoy it. Now, I could just say, I really enjoy it, right? I've said the same thing, but I can preface what I'm gonna say by truth be told. In other words, this is the truth. The, the real reason is I actually really enjoy it. Truth be told. Truth be told. Alan, what do you want to do with your career, right? Uh, yeah, well, truth be told, I want to change it and do something different. But it's uh, similar to, to tell you the truth, to tell you the truth. Exactly, Monica. To tell you the truth, yes. So I can say to tell you the truth, or I can say truth be told. Yes, Mona. Uh, teacher, is this the synonym of in fact or not? Not exactly, but, okay. but similar, similar. Um, in, in fact, um, yeah, similar to in fact. Um, in, 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 yeah. Let's think of an example of in fact, right? Um, It looks a, a nice day there, Alan, right? I, I, you know. Yes, but in fact, it's actually quite cold. Mm -hmm. Yes, but in fact, it's actually quite cold. So, so in other words, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell you something that's actually factual um, that you maybe didn't realize, in fact. It's like a clarification. Clarification, yes. is that possible? Exactly. In fact, used to emphasize the truth of an assertion, especially one contrary to what might be expected or has been asserted. The brook trout is in fact a char, right? That's, a, that's something that comes from fishing, right? Okay. What does in fact mean? In reality, in truth, actually, for example, she was, in fact, eager to join the club or in point of fact, that's another thing people say, in point of fact, his parents never had much influence on him. So someone might say, um, um, oh, it's terrible what's going on in Ukraine. Yeah, that's right. But I could say, in point of fact, it's the Russians that have been the aggressor. But it's not the Russian people. It's the Kremlin. It's the, it's the, the government. It's Putin's government. Okay. Are, the re, are the real aggressors here? You can tell I feel strongly about this because that's why I keep mentioning it. Okay, I think we're nearly out of time, boys and girls. Let me see if there's anything I want to, to say. Yeah, so one more, one more. Common expression, strapped for cash. What does it mean to be strapped for cash? Nobody? Okay. Strap for cash. Do you know what it means to be hard up? No. Okay. No. 
Right. Strap for cash means you got no money. <laughs> right. You're out of money. You know, you've got no savings and you're not earning very much or you're out of a job. And you've just got no cash. Right. That's what we mean by strap for cash. In need of, as it were, strapped for cash this week, originating in the mid 1800s as simply strapped, meaning in need of money. The term acquired for in the first half of the 1900s, now the term is also used for other needs, as in I can't give you a more firewood, I'm strapped for it myself. Strapped, right? So in other words, I've got no more, I can't give you any because I've got none, right? Strapped. And people say that as well, they just say I'm strapped, I'm strapped. Are you go on holiday this year? No, I can't, I'm strapped. I'm strapped, right? I have nothing. So I can't go on holiday. I can't go a trip to Argentina. It's too expensive. Even though I'd like to see Buenos Aires. Strapped, right? Now, also, to, me, to say another thing is to say the same thing is hard up, right? Hard up meaning. Short of money. See that? I'm hard, I'm hard up, you know, I'm hard up. I, 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 I'm too hard up to buy fancy clothes. So these are very common idioms for I have no money. People never say I have no money. Um, they would only say this to friends, by the way, or family. They wouldn't say it to a stranger. And here in this country, in this culture, we wouldn't ask somebody you know, how much you earn. But in other cultures, like even there's on this class, there's people have asked me how much money I earn, which I find a very strange question to ask because we would never ask that question of somebody we didn't know intimately. <laughs> but the, the, same, the same happens here in our country. Yeah, well, I won't embarrass anyone or even mention the countries where said person came from, but somebody, very early on in his class asked me how much money I made and I thought that was a very strange question and I thought okay so I have to educate this person now that that is culturally unacceptable where I come from right it's not acceptable right okay well it's over the hour now so I'm going to call it quits I hope you all enjoyed that and had some fun. And um, nice to see some new faces, all from, most of them from Costa Rica. <laughs> well done, Fabi. I'll need to start giving you some. We kudos for collecting your friends. You're the best salesperson. You should be in sales, Fabi. So um, uh, Sunday, I could have a class on Sunday. So I'll have a class on Sunday. It'll be early in the morning. So it's suitable for those east of me. It's not suitable for you guys in Latam. It'll be eight o'clock in the morning. It'll be suitable for people in India or Iran or China. I've got to go as far east as that. I did open the class on Sunday past, but nobody joined. It's, it's very early for me. It's too early for you, I know. Yeah, it's a Sunday. No. Yeah. But what I might do is, this time doesn't suit everybody in La Time, right? So I've got some dedicated followers, let's say, in Colombia, but they can't, they can't, this time doesn't suit them. So I would like to find another time that works for La Time. So I think this time works for some of you, but... I might consider doing one late one evening, which would be round about, like say if I did at 10 o'clock at night, that would be, um, are you six hours behind me just now? What time is it there? Are you four hours? Uh, well, what time is it in um, Costa Rica? In Argentina, it's two o'clock PM. So that's three hours behind. Uh, In Costa Rica, uh, yeah. 11. It's 11. So that's six hours behind, right? So 
if I had a class at 10 o'clock at night, that would be four o'clock in the afternoon. Is, is four o'clock a good time for you guys or not? Four o'clock in Costa Rica? I don't know. What, four o'clock, yeah, 4 p.m. 4 p.m. Is that a good time for Costa Rica or not? Yes, teacher. Yes. Okay. Yes, teacher. Right. So I'll, I'll maybe consider doing one another class at that time. And then it means that if you wish to, you can attend two classes a week if you want. It's up to you guys. As we would say, um, if you're a glutton for punishment, a glutton for punishment. You heard that expression before? People who've been in my class a long time will know that expression, a glutton for punishment. So somebody want to explain? Anyone, no? New to y'all? Like uh, they want, they look for uh, trouble. Yeah, but we use it metaphorically. A person is always eager to undertake hard or unpleasant tasks, right? So it's really, it's really a compliment. I could say Mona, she is a glutton for punishment. She's always at class. <laughs> yeah, so this is kind of a compliment because it's saying she is happy. It's punishment not for doing wrong, but punishment as in work, hard work. And she's a glutton for it. In other words, she's greedy for it. She's greedy for punishment, right? So it's, it's a kind of a strange way of complimenting somebody. Uh, how do you spell glutton? G-L-U-T-T-O. Oh, sorry, I'm not sharing the screen. Sorry, I forgot. Um, my bad. G-L-U-T-T. Yeah, I'll, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. See that? Ah. I'd forgotten, I'd actually just, because it was closing the class down, I'd stopped sharing screen, so now you can see. A person is always eager to undertake hard or unpleasant tasks. Okay. Well, have a good weekend uh, when it comes. And uh, I'll see some of you probably on Sunday morning. And I'll maybe look at doing a class next week, late one evening, as well as keeping this time, the four o'clock time on a Thursday. I've been running since the beginning and it seems to work for a lot of people. So hope you enjoyed that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, T-shirt. Bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. Thank you, bye.